Hey everyone, this is Nick, and if you manage to look away from the burning blue bird for a second, welcome to this Linux and open source news video. This week we have a lawsuit against GitHub and Microsoft to look into how Copilot might be breaking licenses, terms and conditions from GitHub, and copyright law. We have new insights into the new upcoming redesign of Thunderbird, and we have Google working on a massive new AI project. And also we have Microsoft doing some anti-competitive stuff in the cloud space. We have the Snap version of Firefox finally catching up in terms of features and some great gaming news. So let's dive in right after I tell you everything about today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is the only solution I use to run my own Nextcloud server and my only Office server as well. It's a super easy solution to deploy basically anything you want in one click. They have a huge marketplace of applications you can host, from Nextcloud, WordPress, Drupal, GitLab, or Grafana, to gaming servers for Minecraft, Arc, CSGO, Rust, Valheim, and more. They take care of all the configuration for you. All you have to do is click the thing you want to deploy, fill in a few details, and your server is up and running. And once everything is live, it's still super easy to manage your servers, to upgrade or downgrade them, add some storage, back them up, and get help if you're stuck. I've been using Linode for years now, and I can only recommend them. If you want to give them a shot, click the link in the description below, and you'll get $100 of free credit to get started. GitHub is being sued, especially for the use of GitHub Copilot. It's often been called the copyright laundering machine because it basically takes free and open source code to train a code generating algorithm and sometimes even copy and paste entire snippets of said code into proprietary projects. It's always been a hot topic. And now there's a class action led by Matthew Butterick and the Joseph Saveri law firm based in San Francisco. They filed that suit against GitHub, Microsoft, and OpenAI on the grounds that training the AI on GitHub repos violates the attribution requirements of the various FOSS licenses used, like the MIT, GPL, or Apache license. They also claim that GitHub, in doing so, has violated its own terms of services and its own privacy policy, as well as the Digital Millennium Copyright Act by removing copyright management information and the Copyright Consumer Privacy Act and other laws. They state that the class action could be joined by millions of GitHub users. Of course, filing a lawsuit is just the first step, and it will no doubt be a hard one, as it not only impacts GitHub and Copilot, but how AI is trained and works in general. I'm very excited to see where this thing goes, because it could very well redefine how you can work with AI, what you can feed your algorithm, who the outputs belong to in relation to what you fed it, it's going to be game-changing depending on the ruling. Now, I'm very much of the opinion that GitHub Copilot is at least an unethical tool that basically launders free and open source code into proprietary projects. But I'm not a lawyer and I know basically nothing about US copyright law, so I can't say if it's illegal. What I'm sure of is that it's unethical. Now, speaking of AI, it looks like Google is going all in as well. They announced a huge project to develop one single AI model that supports the world's thousand most spoken languages, which could be able to generate text and, more importantly, to translate anything into everything else. They started this by training their AI on 400 languages, and while they didn't exactly say where they wanted to make use of the results, it's quite easy to imagine generating automatic captions on videos, providing search suggestions on Google search in any language, making Google Assistant better at conversational questions and answers, generating text or translation comes to mind. But there might be a lot of other applications. Of course, Google's track record with AI hasn't always been great, like when Google AI researchers wrote a paper outlining the societal bias of AI when trained on the data that's available as an AI will regurgitate basically anything and everything without any knowledge about veracity or harmfulness. Turns out Google didn't like that and fired these researchers afterwards. Now, the applications of this AI could be incredible and could help move society forwards, but the fact that it's owned by Google is the stuff of nightmares. 
I'm generally very enthusiastic about this kind of tech, but I'm also torn between that and the fact that big companies that basically own these big AIs tend to misuse them a lot and don't use them to better society, but instead to worsen it. The big Thunderbird UI overhaul is in full swing, with new mockups being shared for what the calendar portion will look like. And I must say, it's a very cool new look that seems productive and beautiful at the same time. It will support the usual month, week and day view, letting you tweak the days you want to see in your work week, and the toolbar will populate with actions depending on what you've selected. You will also be able to heavily customize the calendar by hiding calendar colors, icons, using category colors instead of the calendar colors, collapsing weekends, or removing the weekend days entirely from the view. New shortcuts will also be available for keyboard users. The event view that lets you fill in or see all the details for an appointment will also benefit from the redesign with a better and more legible layout and the ability to sort attendees depending on their current status, as in whether they will attend or not, or if they haven't answered yet. It will stay fast with just one click to open that view and another one to edit, with an option to get to the edit page as soon as you click on an event. It all looks pretty good, and sure, it doesn't look like it's going to integrate with your GDK or Qt theme, with the Thunderbird app having its own design language, but it still looks pretty beautiful and still very productive. So I'll give it a shot when the official release is out and maybe I'll switch to it. Microsoft is being targeted by Cloud Infrastructure Service Providers in Europe, or CISPE, which is a group of cloud service providers, because they feel the Redmond giant is, again, putting in place some very anti-competitive practices. Microsoft said they would partner with other cloud providers to let their customers virtualize Microsoft technologies on non-Microsoft cloud providers. They then put in place some licensing changes that exclude anyone who doesn't host their own cloud offerings on their own data centers. So anyone who also uses AWS, Google, or even Microsoft's cloud are excluded. A lot of mid-sized cloud providers have their own data centers that they then supplement with offerings from bigger providers to be able to answer the needs of their bigger clients. This change means they're just not going to be able to offer their customers access to Microsoft's cloud technologies, which obviously is bad for them and makes Microsoft a more appealing choice for customers. The CISPE group says Microsoft is irreparably damaging the European cloud ecosystem and depriving European customers of choice, and they hope their complaint will start an investigation from the EU. As always with Microsoft, it's one step forward, two steps backwards. Some parts of this company just can't help but try and build monopolies instead of just trying to compete normally. Now there's an interesting blog post on Mastodon that I felt was appropriate, seeing this platform grew to a million users last week in the midst of the Twitter acquisition. The author points out a few ways in which Mastodon is a very interesting platform to use, starting with data collection, basically impossible at scale, seeing as the network is decentralized and split into a multitude of small instances, each of which you would have to collect user data from. And that same decentralization also makes it more resilient. If an instance shuts down, the rest of the network isn't affected much. Of course, the open source nature of the thing is also a plus, as anyone can start their own instance and connect to any other, which also leads to specialized instances, yet another advantage, letting you specialize and interact with specific communities exclusively, all while retaining access to all other federated instances in the same timeline and with the same account. These very specialized instances, being small, can be very well moderated and require verification, so they're not subject to spam bots and trolls. And since you can still connect to any other instance using the same account, you're not locked into a bubble either. And sure, Mastodon still has some UX issues and needs some explaining, especially on the instance and federation notions. Basically, you can think about it as you would think of the internet itself. While you use one internet access provider to connect to all the other servers, you're not locked into the server hosted by your internet access provider. Same goes for Mastodon. If you create an account on one instance, you can still use that same account to connect with people on any other instance that has been federated. And being federated just means that the instance has agreed to be linked to the rest of the Mastodon network. 
I really like Mastodon. It feels like a much friendlier Twitter and it has that old grassroots 1990s, 2000s internet feel of being actually helpful and actually not driven by huge companies and profits. I love it. All the links to access my Mastodon profile, PixelFed or Peertube instances are in the description below. Now, Firefox users on Ubuntu, you can rejoice. The Snap version will finally reach some amount of feature parity with the regular Firefox version, thanks to native messaging support. And no, it's not support for messaging apps or notifications. It's the protocol that lets the browser communicate with the operating system or other apps. They started adding this in July, but now it's in the stable Snap builds, and it should let you do stuff that you would expect, like using third-party password managers, installing GNOME extensions from the extensions website in one click, or enabling the KDE Plasma browser integration add-on to have notifications, volume control, and more. You won't have to do anything special to get that, apart from applying your updates to Firefox. Apparently, there are still issues with some third-party password managers, but most things should work as they were intended, and as they already do with all other Firefox versions. With the performance improvements the Snap team has added to the Firefox Snap, this was the last piece to make Firefox not suck as a Snap. So if you're using Ubuntu or using the Snap version, do your updates and basically should work exactly as other versions do. Although if you hate Snaps, this won't change your mind. Okay, let's finish this with the gaming news. First, the Wii U emulator, CMU, is now available as an app image. They added Linux support recently, but it wasn't readily available for everyone to use. And that's now fixed. It's still experimental, but it should work in basically any distribution out there, including SteamOS, if you want to play the few Wii U exclusives on your Steam Deck. There's also a new version of DXVK, the awesome library that lets your Linux device run DirectX games, by translating their calls from the Microsoft API into Vulkan instructions that Linux can understand. This new release is a big one, with a new version of DXVK native, which can be used by developers to easily port their games, and the biggest change is that games will now compile shaders as they're loaded, rather than when they're drawn. This means that the weird stutters you experience when starting a new map in a game should disappear. Apart from that, expect some bug fixes and performance improvements. I just love all the effort that's being poured into that thing. It's still unbelievable to me how far Linux gaming has come in the past three to five years. I remember the days where I tried to run games just using Wine because none of this existed and I have zero nostalgia for these days. And finally, as Valve brought the new deck UI to the desktop version of Steam, at least in beta, there are quite a few improvements. Scaling should now work better. Windowed mode should yield better results. You can force GPU rendering to get better performance, something that will definitely come in handy when using SteamOS on NVIDIA GPUs, and a bunch of bugs have also been squashed. If you want to try out that new UI, all you have to do is move your Steam client to the beta version from the settings, and then add the dash gamepad UI option to the Steam launcher on your Linux desktop. And I must say this new interface is much, much better than big picture mode. You should absolutely give it a shot. And you should absolutely give today's sponsor a shot as well. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany and they ship laptops and desktops running Linux out of the box worldwide. Buying one of their devices basically means that you remove all the guesswork from trying and knowing if something will run or not. You don't have to research anything. You can just buy the device, slap your favorite distro on it, and it's gonna run because the hardware is compatible with Linux. And if there are a few tweaks needed here and there, they have PPAs and repos that you can add to the distro to make sure that everything is perfect. They have a big range of devices from the biggest workstations, some gaming laptops, Ultrabooks, Nux, whatever you want, they have it and all devices are extremely customizable with CPU options, GPU options, SSD, RAM, your own logo on the lid and much, much more. You can even have your own custom keyboard layout laser etched on the keys, which is awesome. So if you need a new computer and you want to make sure that it runs Linux and you want to support Linux development, don't hesitate to click on the link in the description below and get yourself a tuxedo device. They're really, really good. 
Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to ring the bell, to write a comment, anything basically. And if you didn't like the video, well, you can always dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really want to help support the channel, there's a super thanks button underneath this video on YouTube, there's a PayPal link in the description, or you can join my Patreon members or YouTube members. Both links are in the description as well, and both get access to a weekly podcast every Monday where I talk about Linux, tech, open source, the channel, my personal life, and you also get to vote on the next topics that I'll cover on the channel. So click those if you're interested. And in the meantime, thank you everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!